In the next 30 minutes or so, I'll discuss sports imaging of the foot, multimodality imaging, but the emphasis will be on MRI. And I wanted to uh, tell you I was very, how pleased I am to speak with you today and to thank Laurence for organizing the course. Uh, it's great to be here. Now, what is the role of MRI? And we'll start fairly basic and then move on to some more sophisticated applications. But MRI is useful in the setting of occult bone injury, specifically bone contusion in the competitive athlete. Fractures in specific locations where radiographs are limited. Stress injuries, where really MRI excels. And then a couple of more sophisticated applications, sesamoid injury, and then the soft tissues will wrap up with discussion of turf toe. But what is MRI not good for? It's not good for arthropathy. It's very poor in terms of evaluating complex fractures, such as those that occur in the intraarticular portion of the calcaneus. It should not be used for fracture healing. Radiographs or CT are far better for fracture healing. It's limited, as you know, in the evaluation for osseous bodies, small fracture fragments, or calcification. Now, starting basically with an imaging algorithm, I cannot, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of weight-bearing or standing x-rays. It's often easier for the technologist to obtain an, an x-ray with the patient's supine, but in the setting of trauma, if the patient can bear weight, weight-bearing x-rays are critical. Obviously, the general three views, AP oblique and lateral. In many cases, at that point, we can stop. In some patients, particularly in the competitive athlete, where we suspect occult osseous or soft tissue injury, we move on to MRI. Now, let's, see, let's say we see a cortical avulsion, characteristic of a specific injury. We can stop. At that point, we know what happened. Some patients, though, may go on to CT, and others to MRI. So if we focus on MRI of the foot, there are three basic principles. For imaging purposes, the foot is not the ankle. The second point is that imaging should be tailored to the region of interest and do not in any way attempt to image the entire foot on MRI at one time. Either, either image the ankle, which includes the hind foot, the midfoot metatarsals, say for stress injury, or the forefoot toes for plantar plate, turf toe, or Morton's neuroma. Basically, in terms of imaging planes, we won't talk about coil, coil but obviously a dedicated extremity coil is important. Uh, but it's, it's, the key is here is that the imaging planes for the ankle, while they are transverse, it is not the same for the foot. They're longitudinal, this is our long axis, and our short axis will be perpendicular to the axis of the metatarsals. They will be unrelated to the imaging plane we use for the ankle. So these oblique imaging planes allow us to get very good views of the tarsometatarsal joint. And here we can see the interosseous component of Lisfranc ligament, which I'll speak about in a bit. And here's the short axis image, which is perpendicular to the metatarsals. Now, some people do a double oblique long axis. We don't typically do this regularly, where we angle along the axis of the metatarsals, medial to lateral. And this gives you a T1 weighted image, as you see on your right. I won't spend a lot of time on imaging parameters. Field of view, obviously small. Three millimeter sections, and in the forefoot in particular, for dealing with plantar plate or turf toe, two millimeter sections are critical. The judicious use of fat suppression with fluid sensitive sequences is important. Helical CT of the foot, same thing. Imaging planes, long axis. <laughs> Sorry about that. Imaging planes will be the same, long axis and short axis. And in some cases, the orthopedic surgeons prefer that 3D reformats, either surface and or volume rendered, be, uh, are useful for their applications. So now starting on specific applications with regard to MRI. Acute trauma, negative radiographs, competitive athlete. We talk about bone contusion and fracture. I'll speak about TMT joint injury, anterolateral process of the calcaneus, EDB avulsion I'll mention briefly, and then focus a little greater on stress injury. Here's a professional baseball player who fouled a ball off his foot. And you can see, as indicated by the red arrows, there is an extensive contusion in the medial aspect of the navicular bone, T1 on your left, inversion recovery scan on your right, easily identified. And you can also appreciate that there is some bone marrow edema in the medial cuneiform. Same patient, short axis images, T1 on your left, coronal proton density with fat suppression, again showing the osseous injury localized to the medial navicular. Here's a 13-year-old soccer player who had a negative radiographs, came to MRI, and we can see this fracture just beyond the physis uh, in the proximal aspect of the bone, non-displaced. No surprise that we can't identify it on radiographs. 
But let's move on to an area that is, I think, important, and in the United States at least, this is an area of medical legal importance uh, for radiologists and orthopedic surgeons, and that's the evaluation of TMT joint injury. As you know, the Lisfranc frank joint, or TMT joint, is the articulation of the distal row of tarsal bones with the five metatarsal bases. And the key for stability of the foot is the fact that the second metatarsal base is recessed. And this is important in stabilizing the, the arch of the foot. And we call this a mortise joint. And then there are ligamentous contributions to stability, which I will focus on as well. <clears throat> now we think of Lisfranc frank injury as a high velocity injury, say in a motor vehicle accident. But in athletes, these tend to be low velocity injuries and therefore more difficult to detect on radiographs. And therefore in this group, Rather than fractures, ligament tears predominate, therefore the value of MR, and in fact in US football this is the second most common foot injury in college players. So what is the role for MRI? Well radiographs and CT remain the mainstay, but we must be familiar with MR imaging findings because we may come upon them unsuspectedly. And again though, keep in mind that small fracture fragments can be missed on MRI. There are a number of ligaments I'm showing you here. This is just a depiction of the Lisfranc ligament itself, which courses from the medial cuneiform to the base of the second ray metatarsal. There are ligaments that course between the bases of the lesser metatarsals, second, third, third, fourth, fourth, fifth, the intermetatarsal ligaments, but there is no intermetatarsal ligament that courses between the first and second metatarsal, hence the value of the Lisfranc ligament and the importance and stability. Now there are actually three components to the Lisfranc ligament. The one that we focus on most, uh, principally rather, is this thick central component, the interosseous component, which can sometimes be divided up into two bands. There is a small dorsal component, and then there's a variable plantar component, which sometimes has two limbs. Here's some normal examinations in short axis, T1 weighted scans. The blue arrows indicate the interosseous component, you can see it on a couple of images as it's coursing, the green arrow, the plantar component, and the red arrow, the dorsal component. In long axis, this is the interosseous component, the principal, most strong component of the tarsometatarsal droid complex, and we can see it nicely on T1 and inversion recovery scans. Here's a plantar component in, in a long axis, something we see more variably. Patient comes in with midfoot mid sprain, we suspect tarsometatarsal joint injury. If there's malalignment on weight-bearing radiographs, we're probably done with the workup. That patient may get a CT for surgical planning or may go right to surgery. There really is no value for MRI in this case. If there is no malalignment, and it's important to make the diagnosis, and again I mentioned the medical legal climate in the United States with regard to missing these, it's important to consider an MRI. Here are some examples. Patient with a pain after a fall and negative radiographs. And you can appreciate that there are contusions in the middle cuneiform and base of second ray metatarsal. Next set of images, we can again see the second metatarsal base contusion, but the blue arrow indicates that the Lisfranc ligament has been disrupted, or at least severely sprained. 28-year-old female, tennis injury with left midfoot pain. And here we have the luxury of weight-bearing images on both sides. And there is a subtle finding here. There is no obvious malalignment, but if you'll notice, there is very slight relative widening of the space between the first and second ray metatarsals on the right, as compared on the left rather, as compared with the right, the asymptomatic side. There's also some soft tissue swelling. And this is what the imaging looked like on MRI. Kind of an amorphous appearance to the Lisfranc ligament on T1. Here on this T2 without fat suppression, we can see the ligament is disrupted, as we can here on this fat suppressed sequence. Same patient in short axis, if you recall, the interosseous component courses roughly at this midline between dorsal and plantar, and we can see the postoperative uh, result in this patient who was treated with open reduction and internal fixation. Here's a 37-year-old with midfoot sprain. These are weight-bearing views, and here we see malalignment on the oblique radiograph with the third metatarsal not lining up appropriately with the lateral cuneiform. Lateral radiograph, we see soft tissue swelling and not much else. Here's the MR. And despite the fact that the injury was, la was in the third metatarsal on uh, radiographs, so or rather the malalignment was there, we can see that there's actually a Lisfranc ligament disruption, an injury to the base of the second metatarsal, minimal edema in the medial cuneiform as well. And here again on the short axis, 
where we have disruption of the interosseous component and the dorsal components of the Liz Frank ligament. So consider this joint as a unit. You may see a radiographic abnormality at the third ray when on MRI we can see the fact that the soft tissue injury is closer to the first ray. Now this is what we want to avoid and this is one of the problems we have in the United States with medical legal issues and this Frank injury. These were non-weight bearing views obtained at the time of injury in a 38 year old male who tripped and you can see there's no malalignment here. But he had continued pain and one month later he presents with an almost neuropathic appearing joint. We have erosion here at the base of the second. We have disruption of the Lis Frank ligament, extensive osseous edema, probably something we may have at least had a clue of had we done weight bearing views. This is just an unusual case. This is a CT showing a midfoot subluxation where the cuneiform and the metatarsals are going in tandem. Notice how the first metatarsal and medial cuneiform and second and middle cuneiform are separating each together without malalignment at the TMT joint. There is some fracture off the proximal aspect of the medial cuneiform. Same patient, gross widening here at the base of the metatarsals. He had a more complex uh, uh, repair than the last case, last case I showed you. And finally, a normal variant. This is a 20-year-old 20, 20 male with a hockey injury and midfoot pain. Radiographs were unrevealing. And you can see a well-corticated ossicle indicated by the white arrow at the base of the secondary metatarsal, a so-called os intermetatarsium, which is a normal variant. Moving on briefly to anterior lateral process fracture. This is typically due to inversion injury. It's the attachment of the bifurcate ligament, which has limbs which go to the navicular and cuboid. And this fracture we bring up in this, in this setting because it may be occult on radiographs. It may be obscured on the lateral projection. These patients present with pain near the sinus tarsi. And you can see B on this slide is the bifurcate ligament. And the issue is that they're treated conservatively with immobilization, but this may take months to heal. And in some patients, the fragment ultimately is excised because it never heals. Here's an example on your left, radiographs are relatively normal. And on your right, we can see the bone marrow edema on the inversion recovery scan with the incomplete fracture, in this case probably healing in the anterolateral process. Here's a patient with persistent pain three months following injury. Red arrow indicates a fracture, uh, at this point again probably healing, and on the inversion recovery scan on your right. Another example here with CT, uh, a patient with an anterolateral process fracture somewhat difficult to visualize. There may be something going on right in here on radiographs, but CT reformatted in the sagittal plane makes the diagnosis relatively easily. We can also, of course, do surface rendered images. Here's a 3D surface rendered image of the uh, uh, fracture in case the orthopedists find that useful for their operative planning. Four months later, again, CT for healing, and we can see that the fragment has healed. I'd like to briefly mention extensor digitorum brevis avulsion. This is a, a muscle that attaches along the lateral margin of the, of the calcaneus, slightly, dorsal, slightly plantar and lateral to the, uh, the anterolateral process. So ironically, it's a foot injury, but we can't see it on foot radiographs. But we can see it on ankle radiographs, because on these uh, frontal views of the ankle, we can see a small fragment here along the edge of the calcaneus. And it's important to know about this injury, not because it's an important injury, because this will all be treated conservatively, but because you may get an MRI for an unrelated uh, reason, and you see all this muscle edema in the extensor digitorum brevis muscle. Here's the muscle here on T2-weighted scanning. Muscle edema on this uh, fat suppressed fluid sensitive sequence, and here again the fracture. Not an important fracture, it will not be managed surgically, it's all conservative, but it's important to know when you see edema in the extensor digitorum brevis muscle to think about this injury, and also on the AP radiograph in a typical patient who sprained their ankle. Now stress injury is where MRI excels, and has very much, at least in the United States, supplanted scintigraphy. Uh, for evaluation. And as you know, stress injuries are the cumulative result of repetitive stress over time. In a healthy bone, we consider them to be fatigue fractures, an intrinsically weakened bone, insufficiency fractures. And again, what we observe on imaging is the spectrum of disease, kind of the battle between exogenous stress and the rate of bone repair. Common sites at the foot, obviously metatarsals, the so-called March fracture in military recruits, calcaneus, navicular, and other smaller bones of the midfoot. And in general, cancellous bone stress injury is more difficult to detect on radiographs, therefore the value of imaging in the calcaneus. We talked about metatarsal being the classic march injury. There are other athletic activities such as running, which can cause it. 
I'd like to emphasize the role of altered foot biomechanics. And again, the osseous and periosseous edema may be extensive and mimic an aggressive process. Here's a middle-aged female with forefoot pain, a lot of soft tissue swelling at the dorsum of the foot, no obvious abnormality. One day later, the MRI shows periosteal bone apposition along the uh, medial aspect of the secondary metatarsal. Notice the edema within the medullary cavity and in the surrounding soft tissues. Ten days later, we can see callus formation on radiographs. Here's a runner with foot pain, and the radiographs are normal. But in fact, this patient has an injury at the proximal aspect of the third ray metatarsal. Now, this is unusual. If we think about the metatarsals, typically the second, third, and fourth stress fractures tend to be distal, mid to distal. And in the first and fifth, they tend to be proximal. This is unusual. Here's one in the third that's proximal. A lot of low signal intensity on T1. Here we can already see intracortical high signal, periosseous soft tissue edema, a lot of high signal in the medullary cavity as well. This is my foot about 12, 13 years ago after an injury, I don't know how I did that, on the elliptical trainer. And you can appreciate here that I, I had put my foot in the machine and there is uh, edema in the marrow space and surrounding it. So I went and got a radiograph and perhaps there's the earliest, earliest sign of bone production along the margins. Now at our institution, we take care of the Boston Celtics and we see a lot of foot injuries in basketball players, a lot of ankle injuries at the ligaments, which I won't be talking about here, but a lot of foot injuries as well. Here's an NBA All-Star with foot pain. And this, this case highlights for you how sensitive MRI is in the competitive athlete and how it may guide management, or in this case, not guide management. So he, pre he presented with foot pain, it wasn't terrible, and he has really very subtle findings. Uh, Third ray metatarsal, there's a little bit of high signal deep to the cortex medially, a little bit of, high, of edema signal along the medial cortex of the metatarsal. They saw this, they say, you know what, keep playing. So six weeks later, this is what he looks like. Now it's kind of a bad news, good news thing. The bad news is he developed a complete stress fracture across the mid-metatarsal. The good news is it's also virtually healed. So MRI can detect these injuries very early, and impo that's important in a competitive athlete. Here's another former Celtic player who had a Jones fracture at the base of the fifth ray metatarsal, healing nicely following internal fixation with a screw, who presented with new foot pain. And if you look very closely on radiographs, as indicated by the white arrow, there's a subtle incomplete fracture, a subtle, a subtle line along the lateral cortex at the base of the fourth ray metatarsal. And despite the artifact from the metal from the screw, we can see there's a lot of intramedullary edema and uh, periosseous edema, and you can actually see the low signal intensity incomplete fracture. So altered biomechanics, both in athletes and non-athletes, may predispose to stress fractures in adjacent bones. Briefly on calcaneal stress injury, we see this with running and jumping activities. It tends to involve the posterior calcaneus again. It is oriented vertically, perpendicular to the orientation of the trabeculae of the bone. In this case, another example of a posterior calcaneal stress fracture. Again, vertical orientation. This is the orientation of the trabeculae. Now, one of the most difficult fractures from a management standpoint and from a diagnosis standpoint at the foot in athletes is the navicular stress injury. These fractures occur in the sagittal plane relative to the foot, and they may be incomplete involving the po proximal cortex only. So we do MR fairly early to look for bone marrow edema and to look for a low signal intensity fracture line, but again, CT is important for healing. Here's a 19-year-old male athlete for, who had foot pain for four months, and if we look very closely, as indicated by the red arrow, you can see questionable, a very tiny line along the proximal cortex of the, of the navicular. Now these fractures propagate from proximal to distal, dorsal to plantar. It's fairly regular in how they propagate. When we got the MR, again, we're four months after the injury, this fracture is fairly extensive. It goes almost to the distal cortex, and it goes all the way from the dorsal to the plantar aspect of the navicular. Here's another example on CT of a navicular stress fracture. Here's a complete fracture, which traverses uh, uh, proximal to distal. Again, this will be used, CT will be excellent here to look for healing, especially after surgery. This is an unusual case. This actually is the last case with the navicular stress fracture again. And this is an unusual case of a very far lateral navicular stress fracture. Uh, and here again is the tuberosity of the navicular where the PTT inserts. Here we're way off to the side. Kind of an unusual case based on location. Same patient, shows you the, shows you the appearance on short and long axis images.
I'd like to finish up with a discussion of first ray sesamoid and then end up discussing turf toe. These areas are interrelated. The sesamoids are contained within the MTP joint capsule. They're surrounded by tendons of the medial and lateral bellies of the flexor hallucis brevis muscles. Dorsally, as you know, they're covered by articular cartilage, articulate with the base of the metatarsal head. The FHL tendon courses between the two bones, and they're extremely important in gait and weight bearing, with a greater amount of force placed on the medial or tibial sesamoid than on the lateral or fibular sesamoid, hence the medial is more susceptible to trauma. Now, we can think of sesamoid injury in the setting of acute fracture. Stress injury can occur. We have a grab bag term called sesamoiditis, or irritation of the sesamoid, probably due to repetitive trauma without obvious fracture. We can have osteonecrosis of the sesamoid, and probably the most difficult thing we struggle with is the role of a bipartite sesamoid. Is a bipartite sesamoid more prone to trauma? And I think that's not something I can answer, but there are varying uh, foot and ankle surgeons who have different opinions on this. Now, what I'll be speaking about with regard to turf toe injury is another aspect of sesamoid injury, but I'll come to that in a moment. Here's a, an example of a sesamoid fracture, a patient with a karate kick and plantar forefoot pain. Notice how the fracture line is more regular than we would see with a bipartite sesamoid. Same patient, short axis T1 and stir imaging again showing the bone marrow edema in the tibial sesamoid. Now here we have a patient with right forefoot pain. One of the clues on radiographs that you're dealing with a bipartite sesamoid is the size. Typically a bipartite sesamoid will be much larger than a sesamoid that has only one component. And you can see how large the tibial sesamoids are in this patient bilaterally. Um, there is, if you look closely on the left, a small, a small cleft, but on the right the cleft is widened. And this is what can happen when direct trauma occurs to a bipartite sesamoid, or as I'll discuss in just a moment, when a, a, a injury occurs putting tension on the, on the sesamoid, you can diastase the two fragments, and that would be in the setting of turf toe injury. This is an unusual case, patient with right forefoot pain, and you can see that there is low signal intensity on T1, high signal intensity on T2 again with a bipartite sesamoid. In this 16-year-old, we have low signal intensity on T1 in the fibular sesamoid, very mild osseous edema on T2, and other findings suggesting osteonecrosis with serpiginous low signal intensity lines within the sesamoid. This is a sagittal fast spin echo T2, similar finding, and the sesamoid will ultimately appear quite sclerotic on radiographs. To end, I'd like to move from the bones to the soft tissues and talk about hyperextension injuries at the MTP joint of the great toe or turf toe injury. When we think of trauma to the distal foot, we have to separate the first ray or hallux from the lesser rays, the second and fifth. And what, what differs in terms of the anatomy are the presence of these sesamoids because the sesamoids are, in, are important in the attachment of the plantar plate at the first ray. Well, there are no sesamoids of any consequence at the lesser rays, and the plantar plate courses directly from the metatarsal head to the base of the proximal phalanx. So I'm not going to be talking about plantar plate injuries at the lesser rays, which tend to be degenerative and more attritional. I'm talking about injuries at the first ray, which tend to be traumatic, chiefly in sports. Now, if we look at the anatomic considerations of the first ray, and I discussed the unique anatomy of the hallux, there are fibrous or ligamentous connections between the sesamoids and the base of the proximal phalanges we call the sesamoidal phalangeal ligaments and they are part of the plantar plate of the great toe. And this depicts that it here is this band of tissue which goes separately from each sesamoid to the base of the proximal phalanx. So rather than at the second ray where this, this inserts right on the metatarsal itself, here we have an intervening sesamoid which makes the picture more complicated. There are many ligaments here. I just want to mention there's also an intersesamoid ligament. I'll show you a case related to that a bit later. So what is turf toe? It's a first MTP plantar capsular ligament sprain. Traditionally, it was associated with artificial playing surfaces. It became very popular in the United States to uh, about 50 years ago. Instead of having to water the grass and mow the lawn, you'd put fake grass in, which we call turf. And also, at the same time, more flexible athletic shoes were utilized, which allowed more bending of the forefoot. We commonly see it in American football, but can also be seen in wrestling, rugby, or soccer. The mechanism is forced hyperextension with a fixed forefoot and elevated heel. Some people use the term hyperdorsiflexion, which I think is confusing. What this injury does is pulls the capsule ligamentous structures and sesamoids dorsally. An axial load is applied, and the capsule ruptures.
a little bit about TERF. How did we get that name? So TERF was invented, uh, again, probably about 50 years ago or more. Uh, they thought it would be a great, a great invention uh, because, as I say, you didn't need to water the lawn. The problem was it was very firm and injuries increased significantly with the use of artificial grass. You could, it's quite good to cover your car, but really it's not very good for an athlete to play on. And the name AstroTurf was patented by the, the first, the company that produced turf, and it was named after the Houston Astrodome, which at its time was an indoor stadium known as the eighth wonder of the world. And the fake grass is noted on your right. And uh, I think in many, we, stadiums have been getting rid of this as, for many years now. So if we look at recent data on turf toe, out of the foot and ankle literature from 2014. This is data from the National Collegiate Athletic Association in the United States, a, a, an association of major colleges that have sports. For over a five year period, it is a very rare injury, 62 one thousandths per 1,000 athlete exposures. In football, it's more commonly encountered in running backs and quarterbacks, and again, significantly more common on third degree, which is an advanced astroturf, than on grass. Grass is best. And this shows you out of the Australian literature what happens. Notice how there's hyperextension at the hallux, and then, boom, the patient comes down on their own foot, and an axial load is applied, and you tear the plantar plate. When we are looking at the forefoot, it is, it is critical to optimize the imaging. And so when we are looking at plantar plate of the first or second ray, we are not interested in doing sagittal images of the lesser rays. You want the thinnest possible sections of the area in question. And we also add gradient echo in those settings. So let's look at the normal anatomy. The flexor hallucis longus centrally, and these are the sesamoidal phalangeal ligaments on each side. And this is what it looks like on the sagittal stir image. Here's a sesamoid, and here's a sesamoidal phalangeal attachment. In gradient echo, this is a bipartite tibial sesamoid. You can see the nice sesamoidal phalangeal attachment and the lateral one in the same patient, a little bit thicker, but intact. Contrast this with this case of a patient with a great toe sprain. The first thing to notice is that the sesamoid is retracted proximally. That gives you a clue that there's something going on. And this sesamoidal phalangeal attachment is gone. It's amorphous. Now we come to the midline of the toe, and the FHL is unaffected. Then we go by the lateral part of the toe, and here's the lateral sesamoid pulled way back, and again with disruption of the sesamoidal phalangeal attachment. We can see concomitant chondral injuries in great toe sprain, as you can see here. Uh, sesamoid contusions, as you can see here, and here on short axis, again, the soft tissue component. Here's an unusual case, a 20-year-old with longitudinal tear at the intersesamoidal ligament. And here we can see that there, are, that there is a cleft in the sagittal plane at the margin of the intersesamoidal ligament, again, a less common pattern. Now, anywhere along the medial base of the foot, from the, from the, from the attachment of the, of the ligament proximally to, proximal to the sesamoids, you can injure with this hyperextension mechanism. Even unusual muscles, this muscle here is the adductor hallucis. We talk about the abductor hallucis, this is the adductor hallucis. This muscle is sprained at the same time that there is disruption of the sesamoidal phalangeal ligament. Here's a 24-year-old male who injured his right foot, and I alluded to this earlier. We have the benefit of weight-bearing views on both sides. Notice again, the medial sesamoids are bigger, they're bipartite, and in this case, the force, rather than tearing the ligament, separated the two poles of the sesamoid. And here you can see that the sesamoid is diastased at the bipartite level. It's not an acute fracture per se because there was a cleft there anyways. So here, when they hyperextended, they didn't tear the ligament, we diastased the sesamoid. This case, courtesy of Carl Winowski at Cleveland Clinic, shows a fracture of the sesamoid distally occurring in the setting of a hyperextension injury. These lesions can go all the way proximal to the sesamoid into the flexor hallucis brevis. And here's a patient with a hyperextension injury who has an injury to the medial belly of the flexor hallucis brevis muscle. And if we look on the sagittal image, you can appreciate that if we start distally, the sesamoidal phalangeal ligament is normal. The sesamoid is almost normal, and the, and the muscular attachment at the sesamoid is where the tear occurred. So in summary, when imaging the foot in the setting of athletic injury, it's important to optimize MRI and CT examinations. You want to base them on clinical indication. Be familiar with the relevant anatomy. Use the appropriate slice thickness and use the appropriate oblique imaging planes.
And with regard to MRI, it's important to recognize the spectrum of MRI findings in osseous stress injury and of course acute bone injury as well, soft tissue injury, specifically with turf toe, TMT joint injury, sesamoid pain, and again, the soft tissues of the plantar aspect of the foot in the setting of turf toe. Thank you very much.